Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the Gospel of John, specifically themes in the Gospel of John, and this is lesson number 11 in that series, which has proved to be a very interesting series, by the way. This is the lesson for December 14 of 2024, entitled The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Okay. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we bow once again in our attempt to understand you more clearly as Jesus challenged us to do, help us to import and understand these ideas so that they may bring us nearer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John 13 to 17, I think we're all aware of that, records Jesus' final farewell message to his disciples before his crucifixion, obviously. Surely his disciples were in panic mode when he said that he was going away and that they could not go with him. But he did not leave them without any help. Jim? John 14, verse 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember all that I have told you. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay. Um, it's interesting to say that he, he teach you to remember all that I have told you. Is that still work? <laughs> well, it seems he's like <laughs> when Alzheimer's starts showing yeah. up or even temporary. Anyway, starting in the first chapter of John, we have references to all three members of the Godhead. Jennifer? This is from the Bible Study Guide. All three members of the Godhead are mentioned in John 1. And there are some references from John 1, some verses. For centuries, humans have tried fully to understand the nature of the Godhead. But because we can't, many reject the idea. How foolish, though, to reject something just because we can't fully understand it, or because it doesn't fit within the narrow limits of human reasoning. Yeah, and as many of you out there probably understand, the biggest challenge in the earliest centuries after, of Christianity was, could Jesus, how could he, first of all, and if so, how could he be both fully God and fully man at the same, same time? And one group of people said, no, he was fully human, but he couldn't be fully God at the same time. And the other group said, well, he was fully God, but he just sort of adopted humanity for a temporary, on a temporary basis. And, and those discussions, went on almost ad nauseum for, for a couple hundred years. John 17, 3 tells us that eternal life means knowing God. That's Jim's favorite verse, at least it used to be. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to know God? Following our study so far, is it clearer to you how Jesus related to his Father and to the Holy Spirit? There was a time when Father, Son, and Holy Spirit appeared and were seen or heard together. Mickey? So Matthew 3, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and alighting on him. And then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. Now, we don't have time to go back and look at these quotations, but apparently, I'm assuming it was the Father, promised John the Baptist that he would point Jesus out to him before this occasion. And so, John, this, wasn't, this, was, this was a multiple experience, for at least the Father, because and I, if again, I, I ask when I read that verse that you just read, was Jesus the only one who saw that, or did John see it? Did anyone else see it? Um, what was the Spirit of God coming down like a dove? What would that look like? I think, and, and the importance, um, of, I'm sure there are multiple reasons, but one was because then when he went into the wilderness, Satan said, well, look at, look at your condition. You, can't, you must be the bad angel. You must be the fallen angel. Look yeah. at me, how good I look. Yeah. And so that gave Jesus a reference point that, no, God said, I am his son. And then also at the transfiguration. 
Well, the reason why I'm asking this question, because if you read the Bible, it sounds like there were even Sadducees and Pharisees in the crowd. Did they see and hear this stuff? Yeah. And if so, what did they say about it? I mean, you know. Did they hear the voice speaking words, or did they just hear sound like that's all the so any other, other times that we've heard we've heard of the voice? Any other God. reference points on this? The no. cross point checks that no. we have on this? No. The, no. And Ellen White doesn't comment no. on it either. Just basically what it says there. Yeah. So how can we understand God? Myra? Well, the Bible study guide says, John says that if you want to understand God, you must look at Jesus and what he revealed in the Word, the Bible. This approach opens us a whole new world of relationships among three members of the Godhead, between the members of the Godhead and humans, among humans themselves. This lesson looks at how the Gospel of John presents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but now within the context of the farewell disclosure, John. Discourse, for a farewell discourse. Oh, discourse. That's the, those four chapters, John 13, actually it's five chapters, John 13 to 17. So what did God have in mind when he created human beings? Genesis 1 tells us that all three members of the Godhead participate in creation, in particular, God's purpose for creating humanity was that we should live in loving harmony with them and with one another. Gordon? From the writings of Ellen White uh, in Review and Herald, all heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of men. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made, quote, in the image of God, end quote and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. That's from and, 1902 Review and Herald. Yes. Well, also repopulate heaven, I think. There's a quote yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. Repopulate. After the fallen angels had left, the humans and, were... Yeah. And if you, if you look at the context, in the Bible it says, you know, He made you a unique type of people, and then you're supposed to reproduce. And the first thing that raises my, question, my mind is this. Suppose that Satan had the ability to recreate. He would fill the universe full of little Satans. So God was... Oh, but sadly, it would all end up into death. Yeah. Uh, so it, it can't, can't, ultimately, it can't perpetuate. It, it, the trajectory is always going to be down. Mm-hmm. So I so think it's... It, oh, good. Go ahead. Well, I think it's worth reflecting. Why did Lucifer come here? So, was he so there's so this new and distinct order. There's something different, which I think, in a unique way, we're made not only morally but physically in mm -hmm. God's image. So there's physical, moral, and um, hopefully spiritual and spiritual. So that's explicitly stated by Ellen White. Remember, plus we were some place that says a, equal to the angels or a little lower than the angels. That's even in, in Psalms 8, verse... And then if we passed our probation time, then we would be equal or a little above. Mm -hmm. So I think that Satan didn't like that idea of something being more than him. Um, and we we're unique, so if he could get to that, that would wound uh, Jesus and God even more. And I sort of toy with the idea that he didn't like the idea of this whole sex thing, and so he was jealous that he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was multiple elements of feeding his envy and jealousy yeah. that that's why he came after this world. Specific. It's important to remember, we think about this, but not everyone's aware of this, that this world and humans were created after the sin entered the universe. Right. But the when planning, Adam, the yeah. planning was part yeah. of... Yeah when Lucifer felt faith. left out yeah. of the conversation and he wanted to be part of it, he wanted to add, but he was created, so he had nothing to add to yeah. the conversation about creation. But yet, this earth, the population on this earth was to, uh, created to educate the Satan yeah. and, and all those that came before. We're gonna, we're gonna come to that a little bit later, but you're right. When Adam and Eve were created and the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge was also there with Satan awaiting his chance to tempt them. And there's 
couple of main references for that. That's Revelation 12, 7 to 12, and of course, Genesis 3, 1 to 5. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 tell us that God created us to be like them and to have an eternal relationship with them, living forever in peace, harmony, and righteousness. And yeah, wouldn't that be nice? In order to have love, we must have freedom, and we have a whole handout on that if you're welcome to look at. That is the state of at one -ment. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, that word has been t t the payment of apparently to assuage the wrath of the offended deity. Yeah. No. What's nonsense? Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan and ate the fruit in rebellion against God. They chose to trust the lying serpent in the tree instead of their loving Heavenly Father. Now, fortune, un well, uh, well, so you, you struggle with that. that it wasn't because they believed a lie, but it was because <coughs> they disbelieved yeah. the truth. They had more experience with God. They had um, multiple conversations. And so they knew God. And then yeah. some unknown, who's this, who's this guy that's just showing up saying, oh, did you, do you really know that he's not, has your best interest at heart? So, so like if somebody came and told us as kids that our dad really didn't love us or something, and yeah. we believe who we just met, we believe them over the multiple experiences mm. we've had with our own dad. Unfortunately, even at, and then Adam chose to eat the fruit and showed that they perhaps, perhaps without realizing it, transferred their trust from God to the talking serpent. <clears throat> Ultimately, God must show, somehow restore to human beings the eternal life that he planned for Adam and Eve. So how is that possible? At that very point in time, God had three options. One, he could let them, uh, let them perish because of their sins. That's what he said would happen, uh, Genesis 2.17. Two, he could forgive them and let them continue to live in the garden, thus proving that his statement that sin leads to death was not ultimately true. Or three, design a plan whereby human beings could be won back to trust and depend, dependence on God. Let's take a quick look at what God the Father has done as described in the Gospel of John. One, the Father sent the Son to be the world's Savior, John 3 and 6. The Father gave the, to the Son the right to judge the entire universe, judge John 5, and you could add John 3 and John 12. And then Jesus said, I'm not judging you. Yeah. Yep. So it's like a hot potato. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Three, the bread from heaven and the words that I have spoken came and come from the Father, John 6 and 14, etc. And then Jesus assured his disciples that those who hear the Father will come to Jesus. In the Old Testament, a sacrificial system was set up in which people had to go to the temple. And we sometimes don't realize that the temple, there was only one temple, it was in Jerusalem. If you lived in Galilee, you would have to walk or somehow get or ride a horse or something like 70 miles to, con to go to the temple and confess your sins with a lamb. I mean, imagine that. Maybe they weren't supposed to do it very often. Well, well that might still be. be hard, to, hard to get to confession. <laughs> that might be still true. Well, however, Jesus made a startling announcement. One can ask for forgiveness and salvation directly from the Father. Essentially, he said, I do not need to ask the Father on your behalf because the Father himself loves you and you love me and have believed that I came from God. John 15, 16 and 16, 23 to 27. The coming of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection and his ascension were God's answer to that ultimate question. That offer of salvation is available to all who are willing to accept it on God's terms. John 1, 14 to 18. And you, you're getting the idea here that uh, these are really critical issues. So there's lots of passages in the Bible that we obviously don't have time to read, to read all of them. And passages such as John 1, 1 to 2, 5, 60 to 18, 6, 69, 10, 10 31. I'm sorry, 10 verses uh, 10 and 30 and 20 verse 26 using various kinds of language. Jesus asserted that he and the Father are one and that their work is identical. Ellen White emphasized that idea from the writings of Ellen White. Had God the Father, that would be mine, 
Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling His glory, humbling Himself, that humanity might look upon Him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of His own condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of His instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight and hearing and effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. Very interesting. As we have already noted, Jesus referred to himself repeatedly in the Gospel of John as the I Am, followed by various descriptions. I Am is the Hebrew or Aramaic word for the personal name of God. So Jesus used these statements and then effectively said, if you believe in my words, you will be doing what God wants you to do. But if you're not sure about believing my words, at least you should believe because of the works I do. Jim? John 10? Okay, John 10, verse 30 and 36 to 38. The Father and I are one. But I have witnessed, but I have a witness on my behalf, which is even greater than the witness that John gave what I do, that is, the deeds my Father gave me to do, do these on my behalf and show that the Father has sent me. Do not believe me, then, if I am not doing the things my Father had, wants me to do. If I do them, even though you do not believe me, you should at least believe my deeds, in order that you may know once and for all the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. Good News Bible. Now, let's think about that for just a second. Here's somebody who's been, who's born blind. He's been begging all his life. And now he's walking around seeing. And you say, uh, how did this happen? And you say, well, Jesus did it. And you say, well, that, that's, I mean, everybody does that, right? No, you don't. Jesus is the only one who can finally and ultimately give us eternal life. We know that because, and again from Ellen White. Still seeking to give a true direction to her, Martha's faith, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. From 1 John 5:12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He that believeth in me, said Jesus, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou, th thou this? Christ here looks forward to the time of his second coming. Then the righteous dead shall be raised incorruptible and the living righteous shall be translated to heaven without seeing death. The miracle which Christ was about to perform in raising Lazarus from the dead would represent the resurrection of all the righteous dead. By his word and his works, he declared himself the author of the resurrection. He who himself was soon to die upon the cross stood with the keys of death, a conqueror of the grave, and asserted his right and power to give eternal life from wow. the desire of ages. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, make it very clear that Jesus came to this earth, submitting himself to all the terrible things the devil did to him, and finally died on the cross a traitor's death <coughs> in order to teach us the truth about God and his love for us. Jesus' death showed that the, the term God's wrath is not God's anger, but rather separation from God as a sinner, at the end, will desire. So is the proper translation of the word wrath give us that idea, or we're interpreting? Well, the, the, the Greek word is orge. I don't know the Hebrew word right offhand. This has to do with uh, passion. Yeah, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the ways it is. But it's the, 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 there's a whole handout that we've written, on, I've put together on that. You go back to uh, Judges chapter 2 and 3, and you look at Barakat, because they departed from the Lord, and he was angry at them, or his wrath was against them, and he left them. It just says it again and again and again and again and again. And even back in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, there's one or two places where it says yeah, that. Romans 1, is that? 
Romans 1 also. Over. Mm -hmm. Ra so it's Same wrath, way. but it was uh, translations that was, he gave them up or He gave them, them up, exactly. It yeah. lets you have your freedom. Yeah. It, it, it's relatively simple if you yeah. approach it that way. Mm -hmm. But so unfortunately, that his passion then is even in, it's that Hosea, even in giving us up, yeah. if he feels strongly about <coughs> that. That's what he feels strongly about is, exactly. is giving us up to the consequences of our choices. Yeah. Recognize that you have freedom. <coughs> and I like that phrase, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. That answers a lot of questions as to why things work out the way they do. And God doesn't have to be an active agent. He lets evil run its course. Yeah. How are you going to learn without education? And education takes time. Yeah. So it, An experience. It takes so long, sometimes we forget the original problem. So that's, that's part of the, the yeah. d dilemma. So the separation from God is not because He leaves us. Right. It's because we leave Him because we persistently insist yeah. on that. He yeah. honors your choice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point though. It's not the occasional misdeed or good deed. It's the yeah. tenor, it's the trend. Yeah. But in some place he says, you cannot serve two masters. Yeah. You can't serve in uh, harmony, be in harmony with the Creator and go your own self-centered way. Yeah. Jesus is our opportunity to learn about the Father. Of course, many people do not understand or even reject that idea. Okay. In the context of the cosmos, an atheist wrote, in our obscurity and all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. What does the Bible teach, which shows just how wrong this man is? And I added, obviously, John 3:16 completely refutes that atheist argument. Well, go ahead, Myra. Oh. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that the union with him might share the righteousness of God. Good News Bible. So God says, okay, let me show you what's going to happen to sinners at the end. I think now, it's good to remind ourselves, so I still get confused about the word sin because it sounds like a deed or a, something yeah. we do or don't do yeah. rather than that it's and it's uh, really describing a disruption of a relationship yeah so that's that's what we're yeah. talking about here is a, dis, a distrust a disruption a disconnectedness from God Jesus knew the father however while on the cross Jesus could not see or communicate with the father on the cross, Jesus was experiencing what sinners in the end will choose, eternal separation from God. Okay, Gordon, Ellen, hear, the, hear the words. Ellen White in Desire of Ages says, all his life Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation or healing for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, on the cross, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Now, I'm going to interrupt there. I just, every time I read that, it just blows me away. I mean, the average person by that probably would have been dead already by that time with all the times he was beaten and the crown of thorns on his head and crucifixion, etc., etc. It's amazing. Whip, yeah, the whips that they were using mm -hmm. had balls of yeah. lead and nails and stuff that was, you know, lacerating yeah. his back down to the spine. And so this was uh, yeah. horrendous. The point here is it's amazing. Jesus was more concerned about the separation between himself and his father than he was about all that. His physical pain was barely felt. Or hardly felt. Satan was, oh, go ahead. Continuing, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the father's acquaintance Acceptance. Acceptance, pardon me, of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. 
Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. And when is that going to be? So that's going to be at, at the second death. That's going to be when we persistently insist on leaving him. So that's happening at the third coming. Isn't this a little forensic sounding, that fear that sin was so offensive to God? Mm -hmm. so, so that's interesting language to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, why is the, sin is offensive to God because he knows what it does to his children. Right. What would, how do you feel what, about what it does to someone that attacks your children? That's why when he says, I'm a jealous God, mm -hmm. it's, uh, jealous is, is not his nature, it's he, he's well, for the welfare of his kids. Right. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Continuing with Alan White, it was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. The sense of sin, okay. With amazement, angels witnessed the Savior's despairing agony. The hosts of heaven veiled their faces from the fearful sight. Inanimate nature expressed sympathy with its insulted and dying author. How did inanimate nature know? Yeah. Well, here's, here's what she says. Yeah, the sun refused to look upon the awful scene. Its full bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Complete darkness like a funeral pall enveloped the cross. There was, uh, quote, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. There was no eclipse or other natural cause for this darkness, which was as deep as midnight without moon or stars. It was a miraculous testimony given by God that the faith of after generations might be confirmed. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. Okay, so we, the, earlier we read that Jesus felt he couldn't see through that, portal. Portal. that thing. He couldn't see through the portals, but he couldn't feel his Father's presence. So here it, here it tells you why. Continuing, he makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. They were there even yeah. though Jesus couldn't perceive them. The Father was with the, his Son, yet his presence was not revealed. And who else was there? The devil was there. The devil and all of his angels. I mean, this, can you imagine? The entire host of heaven, the entire host of the devil, all right, so this idea that God can't tolerate the presence of the devil or vice versa. See, some people mm. uh, uh, caricature the, that. So, well, I mean, the devil would cease to exist if God stopped supporting him right, yeah. right now, like that. So. All those metabolic processes would stop. Yeah. So would ours. Continuing, had his glory flashed forth that has had God's glory flash forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. Mm -hmm. He trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. In the thick darkness, God veiled the last human agony of his son. So there's two things going on there. He's hiding himself from the son, but he's also hiding what's happening to his son from all the, the gawkers. Human yeah. Okay, go ahead. God veiled the last human agony of his son. All who had seen Christ in his suffering had been convicted of his divinity. Wow. That face, once beheld by humanity, was never forgotten. As the face of Cain expressed his guilt as a murderer, so the face of Christ revealed innocence, serenity, benevolence the image of God, but his accusers would not give heed to the signet of heaven. Through their hours of agony, through long hours, through long hours of agony, Christ had been uh, gazed upon by the jeering multitude. Now he was mercifully hidden by the mantle of God. Desire of Ages 753.1 to 754.1. Mercifully hidden by the mantle of God. That's nice. Jesus and his Father are one and have been since the beginning. We have seen that demonstrated by his words in John 10, 30, 14, 14, 3, 16 to 21. Just to look at a few of those places, John 10, verse 30, the Father and I are one. 
I don't know how it could be more straightforward than that. John 14, 10, do you not believe, Philip, that I and the Father are, the, are uh, and the, uh, I, am, I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I have spoken to you, Jesus said to his disciples, do not come from me. The Father who reigns in me does his own work. From our Good News Bible again. And then John 3, 16 to 21, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in the God's only son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil deeds hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do, not, who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Yeah, that's why right. it's like it's judgment's a hot potato. So God says, I'm not judging you. I gave it to Jesus. Jesus said, I'm not judging you. It's the light. And this light is not judging you. It's you whether you come to the light or not. So yep. again, it comes back to how we relate and we judge ourselves. Yeah. And he says, the words I've spoken to you will be your judge. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's already, in, he's already told you. To it and come to those words or not. Yeah. Think about your relationship with God in light of our studies so far in this series. We have tended to emphasize that we human beings need to be committed to the truths taught by God. But how much did God commit to us? Think of the life experiences of Jesus, especially the last couple of days. Having studied something of what John said about the true picture of God, think of all the strange and bizarre images of persons that people have worshipped down through the generations. Jesus was determined to set the record straight and to teach us the truth about God the Father. Imagine the price he had to pay to do that. Jim? Okay, where are we at? John, John 1. 1. Verses 10 to 13, mm -hmm. the world, excuse me, the word was in the world, and though God made the world through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. Some, however, did receive him and believed in him. So he gave them the right to become God's children. They did not become God's children by natural means, but, but that is, by being born as the children of a human father, God himself was their father, Good News Bible. And I want to help you understand a little bit about this verse. In verse 11, where it says, he came to his own country, the word country is supplied, it's not there. But his own, the word people is not there. There's a lot of stuff like that, yeah. sadly. And, so, and does that make a substantive difference? It's the same. Well, he, he came ca to his own, it's his, his kids. Yeah, he came to his own, and his own rejected him. That's what it says literally. And then another it's, way you It's can really, really, he came to his own family, and they rejected him. He came home, or, or probably if I was listening to this from my Swahili speaking friends in East Africa, he came home, and his family rejected him. That's the way they would understand it. He came home, and his family rejected him. Okay, sorry. Think of these final words as represented by Ellen White, that Jesus spoke to his disciples on that last evening, which they had together. From Ellen G. White, um, in The Desire of Ages, the Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united to humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. Wow. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. Hmm. Did I raise someone from the dead like Jesus did? Well, so that's uh, could I convert water to wine or? One of those statements that you sort of, yeah, really? <laughs> well, it didn't exercise, I guess that's your interpretation of exercising powers. 
Yeah. Well, as we've seen, God, when he created our world and our first parents, certainly had planned that things would work out better. However, he knew in advance what was coming. Jesus came to this earth and lived that incredible life to see if he could restore a relationship with us that would lead to salvation. He is the way, he is the truth, and he can lead to eternal life. What does the death of Jesus tell us about our relationship to the Father and to him? As we've already noted, <clears throat> Ellen White in the Review and Herald, as quoted in 9, number 16 above, and that I may know him, page 338, stated that if the Father had come instead of the Son, the results would have been no different at all. This, of course, is represented by the fact that Jesus repeatedly said that he came to tell us about the Father. The word Father appears 136 times in John and 18 times in the three letters of John. That is more than one-third of the entire usage in the New Testament. And there's reference there. Jesus lived the life of the Father as closely as it is possible as a human being. Jesus said that if we are not sure if we should believe his words, we should believe because of what he was able to do in cooperation with his Father. Jesus repeatedly said that what he taught is what he had learned from his Father. Okay? Jesus' claims about his relationship to the Father are astonishing. He asserts that all of his teachings are the teachings of the Father, that all he says he had personally heard from the Father, and that belief in him is the same as belief in the Father, that both his very words and his works are all of the Father, and that he and the Father are united in loving and working for the salvation of humanity. What a powerful testimony to the closeness of Jesus to his Father in heaven. Wow. From our Bible study guide. So why do you think that almost all the Jewish religious leaders were so opposed to Jesus? Did they have, and here's the real question, did they have, any of them, have any real idea of who, who Jesus was? Well, if they didn't, you couldn't hold them accountable. So some of them clearly discovered it and learned the truth about him eventually. Of course, Jesus could not be judged based on exterior, external appearances. And here's some proof of what I just said. Myra? Acts 6, 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, mostly Sadducees, accepted the faith. So, so why the difference? Why, why Sadducees, not Pharisees? Well, there's another... They accepted too. That's Acts 15, 5. Yeah, yeah it's a, I just put one, one verse okay. in here in place. So there's a great number of priests, so I think. So that's something to comment but the, on. If, if, <clears throat> from our understanding of things, they should have been the last ones to accept Jesus. Does if, you? If they had enough knowledge. So there's some specific names that we that we know of. Nicodemus, well, yeah. the Pharisees, Nicodemus, Simon, Paul, Paul, Saul, yeah. slash Paul, Joseph yeah. of Arimathea. You know, yeah. those are specific names that we know that came across. Yeah. Does Jesus intend for us to actually live lives following his example? Is that possible? Uh, you you had sort of raised that question a moment about, before. That seems to be what it says, isn't it? What, what did Jesus teach us about the true God versus all the pretenders? <laughs> Let us look briefly at the role of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Jesus. As we know, many did not accept Jesus' teachings. The work of the Holy Spirit is spelled out adequately in John 3, 5 to 8, 6, 63, 14, 26, 15, 26, and 16, 7 to 11. Let's see if we can make sense out of some of this. Here are just a couple. John 14, 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember all that I have told you. Okay, so is it possible to have a close enough relationship with God that the Holy Spirit will help us to remember everything we're supposed to know? Does, what does that have to do with the fact that he also tells us, don't worry about what you're going to say when they bring you before courts and so forth, or bring before the judges, don't worry. 
I will help you say what you need to say. But you need to have, have those memories up there, In there for the Holy Spirit to help us bring them together. Okay, go ahead. Continuing, John 15, 26, not 14, but now 15. The Helper will come, the Spirit, who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father and he will speak about me, also from Good News Bible. Okay, and I always try to remember the most important function that the Holy Spirit has done for us was to inspire the writers of the Bible. The Holy Spirit also makes sure that, that, in, that the inspired records, that is our Bible, have been preserved and correctly represent what he spoke to the prophets and apostles. And that's, of course, a challenge for people who believe in, some who believe in higher criticism, but a, a challenge for people who practice lower criticism, which I used to be an expert in, well, some kind of an expert in. Anyway, the Comforter is, this is Alan White again, the Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the Spirit of Truth, and thus he becomes a Comforter. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus, he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the spirit of truth, working through the word of God, that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. That's a statement that requires a lot of thought. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who had come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit. Now, why, why would she say that? It is the Spirit that makes effective Oh, how, how do you understand that? <clears throat> Is it the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand what Jesus has done? Nobody's going to help me with that. When, when, when's that uh, text? The when's Desire that? of Ages. It's by the heart that the, uh, it's by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil mm. and to impress his own character upon his church. Wow. Of the spirit, Jesus said, he shall glorify me. The Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love. So the spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing his grace to the world. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, and again, this blows me away again, the honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Desire of Ages 671. How well are we doing? Most, most religions don't understand that. No. Uh, they, they, they have no understanding of what the character of God is all about. No. I mean, we were talk, you're talking a foreign language to them. Yeah. And yeah. most Adventists probably don't either. So, to us, do we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in deciding what is right, what is true, and what we should do in every situation? Another way of saying it is it's the spirit of truth. Yeah. And the truth will set you free. Sure. Free from what? Yeah. From all the falsehood. Falsehood and also fear. Now, it's interesting the statement above that accepting false ideas misshapes our character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, separates Lord, us from Lord God. There. Sometimes the life on this earth does not seem to go well. The devil is determined to make life as difficult as possible for faithful Christians. 
Think of the devil's actions as he heard Jesus giving his disciples some final instructions and the promise of the Spirit. Notice these words from Ellen White. Now here we are. Let's think about this now. Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples and he's giving final instructions. And guess who's listening? <laughs> you know, the devil. And taking notes. And taking notes. And he has a, a bunch of his secretaries duplicating notes just to make sure, right? Where are we? Jennifer, I think it's yours. Jim. Oh, Jim? My turn. Okay. All right. At the times, and then, excuse me, at all, all times, times, and in all places, in all sorrows and in afflictions, afflictions, yeah, it is afflictions, when the outcome seems dark and the future perplexing, and we feel helpless and alone, the Comforter will be sent to answer the prayer of faith. Let me interrupt for just a second. The word we use for Comforter in Greek refers to a person when the Greeks went out to fight a war, they had, they had what they called phalanxes. There was a line of people with spears and so forth at the beginning, I mean with swords, and then right behind them was a, a line of people with spears a little bit longer, and then behind them another line of people with spears that are even longer. So what happened? If any one of those people dropped down, the others just kept going, and then this comforter jumped in and see, to see what he could do for anybody who, who, who collapsed on the, on the line. That, that was his job. Okay, go ahead. Circumstances <laughs> separate us from, the earth, excuse me, from every earthly friend, but in no circumstances, no distance can, be separ can separate us from the heavenly comforter. Wherever we are, wherever we go, he is right at our right hand, he is always at our right hand to support, sustain, uphold, and cheer. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 669. And I'm reminded of Ellen White's comments in another place where she says, if you get thrown into prison, don't worry, the Holy Spirit's there with you. <laughs> well, and if you, you could, it's just as valid to substitute the, a, a holy message rather than a, a spirit uh, as, a, as a really holy breath or a pneuma, it's, it's a wind, it's, it works gently on you, and it's always available. It's kind of like radio waves. Waves. It's always available once you've learned it. Okay, Jennifer, I think you're next. From Ellen G. White in The Desire of Ages, we cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in His people, quote, to will and to do of His good pleasure, end quote. From Philippians 2.13. But many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. I'm going to interrupt for a second again. So what is delaying the finishing of God's work? Is it God who's delaying? Mercy. <laughs> not, not at all. God is standing there waiting. Please, people, get into business. Go ahead. This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and He is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. Wow. Jesus knew that despite their faults, the disciples eventually would be victorious with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible statement. Mickey? He knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his. A series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. Wow. The Holy Spirit gives life. Disciples really have uninterrupted victories? <laughs> well, but you see, it says, not seen as such here. Yeah, well, and even today. Yeah. Well, hereafter. The Holy Spirit gives life. He is the helper. We, we just read John 14, 26, 15, 26, above. And then John 6, 63, what gives life is God's spirit. Human power is of no use at all. The words I have spoken to you bring God's life-giving spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person like God is a person. We, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. And of course, that's this famous statement from Ellen White at Avondale, speaking to the students there. 
What are the functions of the Holy Spirit? The Bible study guide says, the Holy Spirit is the active agent in the dynamic process of spiritual conversion. Okay, what does that mean? Oh, that's actually, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be yours, Myra. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, where did, okay. 45. 45. A process described by Jesus as being born again. Even at the beginning of his gospel, John addresses this vital issue of the new birth, which is not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, John 1:13. This miraculous event takes place in, by the agency of the Holy Spirit's stirring influence in the human heart. So what process is he actually talking about? Conversion, right? You, you're going this way, and you turn around and you start going this way because you recognize God and so forth. So that change in direction... Is, is that's what the conversion means and while well, that's a translation from the Greek word which means conversion or um, transformation go ahead it and is Paul, the Holy uh, Spirit what? well Paul says we have to die daily so it's yeah. not just a one-time thing necessarily. yeah no it's but it's the direction you're headed that's the okay. issue the Holy Spirit that awakens the conscience to the urgent need for salvation and convicts the heart of the truthfulness of all that the Father and the Son say and do. Besides being our comforter or the one who sits next to us to bring comfort, the Holy Spirit specializes in conviction. We should be thankful when we experience, the, experience a beneficial dose of guilt because Okay, go ahead. Clear, a, it is a clear sign that the Spirit is active in our lives, wooing us to make things right. And so we're all very thankful when we start feeling guilty, right? <laughs> so well, there's a difference suggest. between, I make a distinction between acute guilt and chronic guilt. So acute guilt is like a red light on the dashboard telling us something's wrong. Uh -huh. Fix it. Okay, so if we don't fix it, then it becomes chronic guilt. So in my patients, it's you like start ignoring the red light. I did something bad. That's acute guilt. So you should fix it. But if you ignore it, then it becomes chronic guilt, and then I am a bad person. And mm -hmm. so then God has to, <clears throat> which keeps us, makes us alone, keeps us from God. So God has to use metaphors to woo us back. Well, it's, I'll tell you what, it's as if I don't remember, it's as if I put it behind me, it's as if I throw it in the ocean, it's as if yep. far from the east, from the west. So let's still talk, okay? Let's work it out together. So don't stay away, let's still talk. So that's yes. the solution. Wonderful, thank you. And we should remind people that you work with people who have convict, who have, uh, uh, what do you call Addictions. It? Addictions is the word I'm trying to think of. Okay. Other functions of the Holy Spirit alluded in John's Gospel are found in John 16, 8 to 15. To begin with, the Spirit convicts our consciences with guilt regarding the sin that plagues us, and that must be removed from our lives. Second, He convicts us of righteousness, of the joy of doing what is right instead of what is selfish. This righteousness, both imputed and imparted, comes only from the Son, only from the Son of Righteousness, through the mis ministry of the Spirit. Third, the Spirit convicts us of judgment, which is sure to come. This conviction should lead us to repent and be ready for Christ's soon coming. The conviction of the coming judgment should hasten our coming to the Father in true repentance and reformation. Fourth, the Holy Spirit guides us into the truth as it is in Jesus. Our in, excuse me, in our witnessing to others, Jesus brings us, brings to our memory the things that we need to say at the right time, Luke 21, 14, 15. Fifth, 
The Spirit glorifies Jesus in the honoring of His words and will. So the Holy Spirit specializes in conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Has He been trying to speak to you? How do you respond when you get conviction from the Holy Spirit? How does it make you feel to realize that Jesus is and has been praying for you since His time on this earth? He prayed very personally for Simon Peter. Luke 22, 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has received permission to test all of you to separate the good from the bad as a farmer separates the wheat from the chaff. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back to me, you must strengthen your brothers. Good News Bible. Okay, Jesus also prayed for Jerusalem despite the rebellion of its people. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the, uh, you killed the prophets and stoned the messengers God has sent you. How many times have I wanted to put my arms around all your people, just as the hen gathers the chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. How do we understand the following verse, Jim? Numbers 5, 7. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God who could save him from death. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. Would it be appropriate for us to pray with loud cries and tears? Jesus' final prayer before his arrest, trials and crucifixion is found in John 17, 1 through 26, and we don't have time to read through all of that. Let's talk about what we have learned in this lesson. We've learned that all three members of the Godhead were involved in creation. We've learned that they uh, work together in, in trying to help us, that the Holy Spirit has come to take the place of Jesus in the final events of this world's history, and He is the one who helps to guide us, giving us the information that we were originally given by Jesus. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank You so much for the privilege we have of coming to You and asking for this kind of help directly from the throne of God. How could we turn that down? How could we refuse it? Help us to come nearer to you and closer to you each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.